hi everybody. Um, my name is uh, Ayman Mabuk. I'm a main special ecologist uh, working for CSS uh, on a federal contract for NAWA NCOS, and I'm based in uh, Silver Spring, Melbourne. Uh, my presentation will focus on uh, uh, NCOS best practices uh, for uh, ground truthing to develop lake bed uh, maps in the Great Lakes. And uh, I'm going to use the Abasso Island uh, National Lake Shore Mapping Project as a case study today. So first, who we are, the National Center uh, for Coastal Ocean Science, or NCOS, is part of the National Ocean uh, Service, NOS, of NAWA. We deliver ecosystem science solutions uh, to sustain thriving uh, coastal communities and economies. Uh, we provide coastal managers uh, with information and tools they need uh, to uh, balance society's uh, environmental, social, and economic goals. Uh, NCOS first and the uh, main priority is uh, uh, to, uh, to provide uh, 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 advanced, actually, ecosystem science for conservation and sustainable use. And um, here's where uh, habitat mapping actually fall as one of our main activities. Um, many of our mapping uh, projects are within the National Marine Centuries. That's why I have this uh, updated uh, uh, map for the National Marine Centuries. And some of these projects are uh, in the Great Lakes, as we will see uh, in the next uh, slide. Um, we work with uh, partners and collaborators uh, from inside NAWA and also with other uh, federal uh, and state agencies. Uh, on, on these mapping projects. And in the Great Lakes, we mapped uh, high uh, priorities areas. Uh, these areas were uh, identified based on uh, the management needs and the stakeholders' contributions. Uh, our first uh, project uh, was in Lake Michigan uh, from 2017 to 2019 uh, for the Wisconsin Shipwreck Coast National Main Century at Shabogan and Manitowoc. The second project uh, was uh, in Lake Huron for Thunder Bay National Main Century, uh, where we mapped Michelin Reef and Albina Amberley Ridge. And uh, finally, the, uh, the third project uh, was in Lake Superior from 2020 to 21 for the Abastol Islands National Lake Shore. And uh, it, it is our case study in, in this presentation. Uh, why we do this mapping is to characterize the lake, lake geomorphological features, substrate and habitats, and uh, also to support uh, the Great Lakes restoration. Um, the study area for the Abbasal Island National Lake Shore located west of the Bayfield uh, Peninsula between Park Point to Sand Island uh, with a total area of 83 square kilometer. The area was known uh, uh, to be important for uh, fish spawning, uh, especially lake herring, uh, lake trout, and lake whitefish. The map you, you see here is uh, for, the, for the location uh, of this uh, spawning ground, this historical spawning ground, uh, we, we digitized it from uh, Coberley and Howell, 1980. Uh, in 2020, Global collected multi beam data, bathymetry, and uh, uh, and backscatter two meter resolution uh, for this study area using the National Park uh, Service boat uh, ECHO. Uh, the bathymetric uh, imagery shows the, the depth distribution in the study area uh, that ranged from five meter to six, six meter. While the backscatter mosaic you see here shows the intensity of, uh, of the return sound to the multi beam sonar, uh, a weaker return indicates. Uh, um, uh, soft bottom or soft substrate, and uh, such as uh, the mud or salt, and uh, it appears here in a dark, uh, darker color on the map, while the stronger return indicates a hard bottom, such uh, as rock, bedrock, mussels, and appear lighters on the map. This information is essential uh, for habitat mapping, but uh, is, is not enough to characterize uh, the uh, the lake bed geomorphological features and habitat uh, in the areas. That's why we need ground truthing. So NCOS main uh, role in this project was to conduct the ground truthing survey 
and also to develop uh, the classified uh, habitat map for this area. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the, the first part, the ground truthing process, and my colleague Charles Menzel is going to talk more about the uh, predictive modeling and uh, the, uh, the classification of the habitat map. So ground truthing is one of the essential steps in developing high quality habitat maps uh, for, from remotely sensitive data. And here's the workflow we use uh, to give you an idea about uh, the mapping process and where the ground truthing uh, process located in this uh, uh, workflow. So first, collecting the remotely sensitive data, uh, mainly multi-beam, bathymetry, and backscatter. Um, uh, this data go through a feature extraction process uh, to develop the unsupervised feature map that we use for ground truthing, and then after that, we produce the uh, the supervised habitat maps, and we run the accuracy assessment process in order to have the final habitat maps. So uh, before we go into the field and start to plan for collecting ground truthing data, we have to get a better understanding about the uh, liquid liquid uh, features and the substrate and the study area. So uh, we start to compile all the existing. Uh, ground truthing data from our partners and collaborators. Um, the map here shows uh, the types and uh, location of these existing uh, ground truthing data. So we managed, uh, so we managed to have uh, underwater videos and photos uh, from the National Park Service and the EBA, and also sediment samples from EBA, and historic substrate data from uh, the Natural Conservancy, and uh, uh, independent uh, fishery independent data from uh, USGS from the bottom trolling. This data didn't just uh, give us a better understanding about uh, the habitat in the study area, but also help it to, to determine how we will adopt the CMAX classification, which is the standard classification, and it was our, one of our objectives. So here are some of the, uh, like, analysis and results from this existing ground truthing data. So uh, as you can see, we're, we have here like uh, the fine unconsolidated substrate uh, as one of the CMAX classes, subclasses. And this was in, in Park Bay. And also like uh, uh, fine unconsolidated substrate in Siskuit Bay. and also rock substrate uh, as an outcrop, bedrock. And uh, another uh, substrate here was a coarse, unconsolidated substrate, which was a mix between boulders and cobbles. So this data actually gives us a, a better understanding so uh, about the substrate and the, and the bottom features that we're going to actually uh, find in, in the area. And uh, now we have, we can plan to start the first step in the ground closing, which is selecting the, the ground closing sites. Uh, so 203 uh, ground closing site, sites were purposefully selected to collect information on specific features, shapes, uh, uh, and patterns visible in the uh, remotely sensitive data, like the backscatter and uh, the uh, multi beam and, and the bathymetry and the derivatives. And also uh, 220 accuracy assessment sites were uh, randomly distributed among the, stra the strata of uh, the unsupervised uh, liquid uh, map. Ideally, the ground truthing uh, sites are selected, surveyed, and also analyzed, as we saw in the, in the uh, workflow first, in order to come up with the uh, uh, the supervised uh, habitat map, which we're going to use it later for the, uh, uh, the accuracy assessment, to select the accuracy assessment site. But in our case here, because of limited uh, time and budget uh, and logistics, we had to select ground truthing uh, and the accuracy assessment site both and surveys them both at the same time in the same mission. So there are many uh, methods, actually, that you, you maybe heard about them today uh, for collecting uh, 
uh, ground truthing uh, data. And here I'm, I'm, I'm having some of them. Uh, selecting the right method is, uh, is actually depending on the scope of work, uh, the depth range for the study area, and also the, uh, the timing and budget. Um, and we have here, like starting from using diapers uh, and using GoPro, uh, GoPro on, a, on, a, on, a, on a frame and using sediment grab uh, that we modified in other studies with GoPro and the uh, CPU camera, uh, up to using an ROV and AOV. And finally, uh, on the bottom uh, left, you have the drop camera which in, uh, effectively used it in, in the Great Lakes and most in all of our Great Lakes uh, mapping projects and, uh, and also in this uh, case study. So uh, the drop camera system consists of two parts. Uh, the camera itself with its accessories like light and the laser uh, scales, which we add, added them to the camera. And uh, the, the other part is the top uh, side uh, console, which has the monitor and has the receiver, the uh, recorder, and the battery. So the advantage of this system is, is that it provides a, a live underwater video, uh, which can be used to assess the quality of, of, the, bit of the data in, in the field. Besides, you can also do annotation in the field, uh, as we will see. And also, you, you can avoid obstructions. It's also less expensive and easy to operate and handle uh, in the field than other advanced techniques like the ROV and the AOV. And it's effective for shallow depths, less than 30 meter depth, and uh, for discrete sites. Uh, the main disadvantage is, is it have limited uh, camera movement, uh, either downward or oblique view, and we had to do this manually. Uh, in addition, the draft affects the, the camera position and the accuracy of the camera position, and we need to estimate the draft distance and uh, direction from the boat at each side. So, um, usually a team of three uh, can conduct this uh, ground crossing survey. Uh, a boat captain handle the boat and uh, navigate to the side, uh, a top side uh, console uh, and GPS operator to record the, and annotate and manage the data uh, in the field, and a camera operator to uh, uh, deploy the camera and retrieve it, and also to control the movement of the camera under water. Um, before arriving at each site, we had to uh, uh, write down and record the, uh, the, uh, the site information on, on an erasable whiteboard. It's really very important before recording the underwater video. And uh, when arriving at, at the target site, we drop the camera. And once we start to see the bottom, uh, the console operator will start to uh, uh, recording, video recording, and also logging the tremble to take a position for the boat every second at the same time. So, uh, as I said, the camera uh, operator will control the movement of the camera, and one of the disadvantages is that it has a limited movement and limited view. Uh, it's not like the ROV, you can go back and have what you missed, or no, it, it goes with the drift. And with the downward view, as we see here on the top, you can uh, have a limited uh, footprint, while with, when you do the, uh, the uh, oblique view on the bottom, you have a wider uh, uh, and uh, larger footprint. And uh, the, the camera operator controls this using the uh, umbilical cord and the rope attached to the camera. So at the same time, while uh, the camera operator is doing this and filming, uh, the, uh, uh, on the deck the, there's uh, a console operator who is uh, recording and, uh, and also like taking notes uh, from the video uh, on uh, uh, data library, custom made data library we did on the Trimble GPS, where he, uh, like uh, we have them uh, on the sheet here, we print them out. So they, they put the ID and also for the side and the different substrate he can uh, uh, have from the video 
and also the biological cover. And once we have enough data uh, at that site, which mainly like from one to two minutes, uh, we stop recording and we stop also logging the GPS and retrieve the camera back. At the end of the day, we have two sets of data. We have the, the video recorded and also the, the GPS uh, data. And we recommend at the end of each day that we, we uh, download this data and also uh, uh, upload them on two mirrored external drive. Uh, this data need to uh, have a, what we call post-processing. Uh, so post-processing uh, for the GPS data will correct the data and improve the, the port accuracy to submitters. And um, uh, also for the for the video, they need to be reviewed, uh, edited, clipped, uh, renamed, and also transformed uh, into a, a standard format so they can uh, simply be uh, uh, shared online and also to prepare for the inter, uh, interpretation process, which is the next uh, step. We also recommend here to have uh, what we call post-processing uh, sheet uh, to help tag these post-processing uh, steps for both the video and the GPS data. After the GPS data and videos are post-processed, uh, two researchers will start the interpretation process for the ground truthing and accuracy assessment, but they do this independently to avoid the bias. And uh, they do this using uh, a, a measurement schema we developed uh, from our working in the Great Lakes that adopts the CMAX classification. Uh, this schema uses the percentage cover of the different substrate and uh, the biological cover like basic fauna and flora. Uh, in the right table here, I highlighted the CMAX substrate classes uh, that we used in, in uh, this case study based on the substrate composition uh, and its estimated percentage cover below. And um, for uh, the biological cover, we only uh, uh, have had one actually CMAX biological community uh, found in this area, and it was the mixed algal turf community as there was no mussels or, or macroalgae uh, found from the interpretation process. So spatial accuracy and identifying the corresponding tracking uh, points for, for the videos and uh, also uh, it's, it's a really critical for the interpretation process. And um, I'm going here to give uh, uh, an example of how we do this for at one of the ground toolsing sites. So at this site, Site six. So this is how it looks like for the uh, backscatter intensity. It shows that we expect to see uh, a hard substrate due to the lighter and the stronger backscatter uh, reflected. Uh, it could be bedrock, it could be boulder, it could be cobbles. We don't know until we, we go and do the gun tool thing. Uh, so this side, this side actually is gonna. As you can see here, it's going to ground to this uh, green uh, polygon, uh, which was segmented based on the uh, remotely sensed data. And here are the tracking points from the boats, which was taking every second. So what we do actually is to we enter for consistency and accuracy. We only interpret the uh, and annotate the first 30 seconds from each video and uh, which I have them in this box. And these are corresponding to the first 30 uh, 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 point. We identify substrate, benthic community types, and the percentage covers for the whole segment. And uh, on average, this represents a minimum mapping unit which uh, for this uh, study area, the minimum mapping unit was 100 square meter. As a result, we will have a new location for the ground crossing point. In this case, it was uh, three meter from the proposed one, and it still can be used for, uh, for uh, ground crossing this uh, polygon. And one thing we had to take into account is the drift information we collect from the field when we, when we uh, allocating this point, but 
uh, like as we said, the direction and, and the distance from the boat for each side, we had to take this in account when we when we do this. So here I have uh, like uh, the the video for for this for this side. It's a 30 minute 30 second video. So that you can see, it's a hard substrate. Mainly, boulder, uh, mainly cobbles, 80% cobbles with 15% boulders. Boulders are more than 25 centimeters, and we measured this with, uh, with as maybe you can see the laser scale here, laser point. And you can see there was no muscles, uh, no authentic uh, uh, fauna except like argol turf. Which was good because we know that muscles causing problems here. So, so also here we have some examples of the dominant substrate, uh, like the bedrock. We we have uh, we got two types of bedrock: the flat one with with low relief, and this was mainly in the shallow area at Park Point and west of uh, Sand Island, uh, Eagle Island. And the other type was uh, the outcrop. Uh, also, we uh, have uh, we find we uh, find uh, unconsolidated substrate, which one of the subclasses of CMAX, which here the the fine uh, sand. And you can see the impact of the weight uh, we use uh, when it hit the when the weight hit the the, the bottom. It causes this uh, cloud. And we use this to differentiate actually the weight to differentiate between the, the fine sediment and the coarse sand. And this was in Sisquit Bay. And the coarse sand was here, well, actually you can see the sand waves, and this was in the shallow of Park Bay. And another category or another class of CMAX was a coarse unconsolidated substrate, in this case, like this one, the couple field. Like the one we saw in the video, and bubbles, which was less than five centimeters to 0.5 centimeters, which under also the coarse unconsolidated substrate. And finally, the organic substrate, which was mainly uh, wood debris. So all, this work was documented and published in this technical report we have here on, on, on the left. And this is the uh, Encos best of practice for uh, ground coursing. And uh, it described uh, what we did with the drop camera and also with other tools like uh, the GoPro and uh, the sediment gap. We also developed this uh, interactive uh, online tool, the Wisconsin Lake Superior Biomapper, that contain all the existing and new uh, ground coursing data we collected uh, from the survey. And also all the, the maps product. So this is like online and you can use it. And also we we managed to submit all the data to the NOAA archive and they are now accessible and downloadable and online. So what's next? Uh, we will continue participating in future mapping uh, projects in the Great Lakes. There are two projects uh, coming in the next three years. Uh, one is east of Abbasul Island, and the other one is uh, at Gray Bay, Green Bay. Uh, we also are uh, doing experimental work on using the USPL, the Ultra Short Baseline Acoustic Positioning System, to improve the position accuracy for uh, the camera. Uh, the, the system is similar to what the ROV is using for positioning. We also uh, uh, working on using the AUV for ground truthing and uh, using automated annotation uh, using machine learning software like CoreNet software. And finally, we will keep working with our partners to standardize the ground truthing process and uh, disseminate these standard procedures so we can exchange uh, data and also share our data together and improve the habitat mapping in the Great Lakes. So finally, I want to uh, take this opportunity and uh, 
thank our uh, partners uh, from NOAA and also uh, thank uh, Northwestern uh, Michigan College for hosting this event. This is my second time to be here and I'm really proud and really glad to be here again. And um, uh, I want to thank you all for your time and uh, I would, I'm welcome for any questions. We're going to test the microphone. <laughs> Sorry if you had mentioned this for the drop sample or the drop camera and the locations. Was that based on the post process that you had, or was that predetermined prior to acquisition? Uh, for the count tool thing, it was for both of the, the, the intentionally used uh, uh, selected. So there was difference between the count tool thing and selecting the count tool thing point and the accuracy assessment. Accuracy assessment point had to be selected randomly with the stratified, uh, stratified randomly for based on the, uh, the supervised, and ideally based on the supervised classified but the ground truthing uh, point, we select them to identify, identify features, specific features. We are interested to know what all these features are. You know? So it was intentionally uh, selected. Uh, do the images and the perspective classifications exist in a, a repo somewhere, whether that's within CI or in else, potentially to be used as yes. training images? For yes, the video out there. Like if you go and click on this biometal, you can go to any site and you can click on the site video and you can see it. Even the existing uh, uh, data before we do our, like the, the data I showed from the EBA and from the different sources, it's already there. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> 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 cool. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the goals and timeline of the machine learning work that you're doing. Okay. So the machine learning, uh, we, as I, as I mentioned here, I mentioned CoreNet uh, because this is the one uh, I have a little bit of experience working on. And we used it in another project in uh, uh, New York Byte. Uh, and uh, like uh, it, it gave really good accuracy. You just like had to take uh, photos, uh, okay, and give it to the, to the software and tell them exactly what is this and what is this, and, you know. And then they're going to use this photo. And as much as you put from photos, it's really improves it. Uh, the accuracy of uh, what the software can predict for the for the new photo you, that you're going to get. To. So uh, we are planning to use this also here. It could really be a good uh, chance. Uh, 